Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a brand new series entitled, In the Crucible with Christ. Hmm. This is lesson number one in that series for July 2 of 2022 entitled, The Shepherd's Crucible. I don't know, doesn't, crucible doesn't sound like a real comfortable place to be. Well, we'll find out about that as we study it through our series of lessons here. We always begin with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for the privilege of meeting now and talking about you. The wonderful revelations you've, you've given us through your word. Give us guidance into many, many details, including this series on some of the challenges that we might face, especially as we approach the end of time. Help us to understand them and to implement what we can uh, get to know about you as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we start a new series, consider the following from our Bible study guide. Jim? We are starting a long but important journey this quarter. A journey into the meaning of suffering, evil, and death. Yes, suffering can be studied as a separate phenomena of human existence. It can be studied from a scientific or psychological perspective in such terms as perception, affections, and consequences. However, the biblical view on suffering is, such, is much deeper. The Bible explains the origin of suffering, an origin that exonerates God from any responsible, responsibility for bringing into excuse me, bringing sin into existence. The Bible has shown how God uses suffering as a transformational framework for our own enrichment, victory, and eternal life. If we imagine life as a journey, Psalms 23 is one of the best places to start because it talks about a path. This path takes us through the highs and lows of our lives. More important, Someone is guiding us on that path. That someone is more than a guide. He is a caring and loving shepherd. The most important questions for our journey, for our highs and lows, are, do we know the shepherd? Do we trust him, the good shepherd, whatever happens or wherever he may decide to take us? Adult Bible Study Guide. Page 13, huh? Okay. Okay, Carrie, would you introduce us there to the Good Shepherd Psalm? Yes. Uh, talking about Psalms 23, verses 3 through 4. He gives me new strength. He guides me in the right paths as he has promised. Even if I go through the deepest darkness, I will not be afraid. Lord, for you are with me. Your shepherd's rod and staff protect me. And that's from the American Bible Society, 1992, Holy okay. Bible. Okay. Yeah. One of the primary questions that we will need to address in this quarter series of lessons is the question, do we learn more about God from going through difficult times or going through easy times? And so now let's go back to the beginning of Psalm 23, Gary. The Lord is my shepherd. Oh, I meant Gary, not... Oh, Gary, I'm <laughs> sorry. It sounded very much the same. It did. Yeah. Where are we at? Psalm there? 23, 1 there. Yes. Oh, oh, oh. No, it's the next one. There we The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. Good okay, news, The Bible. Bible clearly teaches that God is love. And then Myra? From 1 John 4, 8 and 16. Whosoever does not know God. Does not love. Whosoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. And verse 16, and we ourselves know and believe the love which God has for us. God is love, and those who live in love live in union with God, and God lives in union with them. Good news, Bible. Reading the Bible can be challenging. Some of the stories might appear to make God look very bad. Can we trust him to be our guide? Is God the same today as he was in Bible times, 
even as far back as Adam and Eve. Which stories make him look bad? <laughs> well, people have questions about him killing all the sons in Egypt and uh, killing all the Canaanites and things like that. Elijah. Elijah. And the she-bears. Uh, she-bear. Uzzah. Uh, the kids. Not. Yeah. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And James 1, 17. Every good gift and every perfect present comes from heaven. It comes down from God, the creator of the heavenly lights, who does not change or cause darkness by turning. Good News Bible. During most of the time described in the Bible, this is, of course, we're talking about Old Testament and New Testament, people lived what we call pastoral lives. That means they lived on what they could grow, they, they survived on what they could grow or what their flocks could produce. For this reason, almost every family had some animals. They were all familiar with the work of a shepherd. And you could guess Isaiah 40, Jeremiah 23, Ezekiel 34, John 10, 1 Peter 2.25, many passages. In, let me just pick one. 1 Peter 2.25, you are like sheep that had lost their way, but now you have been brought back to follow the shepherd and keeper of your soul. Just one of the casual references to shepherds and what they do in the Bible. What do these texts teach us about the shepherd guide? We learn that God will care for us and be with us in every situation. If we recognize God's presence with us, could we be afraid of anything? God constantly pursues us, notice that word pursues us, to win and woo us to follow his path, which is the right path and the right thing to do. It is not just those who recognize their relationship and dependence on God whom he is pursuing. He is pursuing everyone. God will do everything he can within the limits of the great controversy and our freedom to bring us back. The great controversy, our freedom. Hmm, those are issues. Okay, Gordon? No, I'm sorry. It's you. It's me, that's right. I'm sorry, you just did your piece. Psalm 23, 1 through 6. We're reviewing those verses again. The Lord is my shepherd. This is from the Good News Bible. I have everything I need. He lets me rest in fields of green grass and leads me to quiet pools of fresh water. He gives me new strength. He guides me in the right paths as he has promised. Even if I go through the deepest darkness, I will not be afraid, Lord, for you are with me. Your shepherd's rod and staff protect me. You prepare a banquet for me <clears throat> where all my enemies can see me. Whoa, whoa, what is that? You welcome me as an honored guest and fill my cup to the brim. I know that your goodness and love will be with me all my life and your house will be my home as long as I live. Can we trust these words about our shepherd? If we can trust them, everything that a person could want is provided by God. Protection, food, health, restoration, and finally a home with God. What more could we ask for? In our day-by-day -day lives, do we live as if we believe these truths? Does our life de demonstrate this to those who know us? <clears throat> Considering the great controversy, trust healing model, why do we blame God if something ha bad seems to happen to us or those around us? If we take a larger view, we know that the devil is the one who has caused all the trouble in our universe. Why is it that terrible natural disasters are called acts of God? That doesn't make sense, right? Well, let's go back to how it all started, so are Jim. They, are they acts of the devil? They should be acts of the devil, but the, the insurance companies would probably have a harder time paying for them if, or getting out of it, maybe, if it was, we call them acts of the devil. <laughs> Revelation 12, verses uh, 7 to 10. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon who fought back with his angels. But the dragon was defeated and he and his angels were never allowed to stay in heaven any longer. We're, come here, we're not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out. The ancient serpent called the devil and, or Satan that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now God's celebration has come 
Now God has shown his power as king. Now his Messiah has shown his authority. For the one who stood before our God and accused our brothers, brothers and sisters day and night has been thrown out of heaven. Our brothers and sisters won the victory over him, but the blood of the to me by the blood of the Lamb and by the truth which they proclaimed, and they were willing to give up their lives and die. And so be glad, you heavens, and all you that live therein. But how terrible for the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, and he is filled with rage because he knows that his he has only a little time left. Good news, Bible. Wow. And that was written 2,000 years ago. What does it mean to say that Jesus leads me in right paths for his namesake? In Psalm 23, 3. If we can accept scripture, which we do, with God's help, the paths of righteousness lead all the way from where we are now to the time when we will join God in his house or home and live with him forever. That does not mean that there will not be any bumps on the road or any problems on the way. So how did David describe those detours on our paths? David saw, only, saw not only paths of deepest darkness in clear view of his enemies, but also paths of greenest grass and still waters. But our final destiny will be God's home. Carrie? But why are these pains called paths of righteousness? or right paths. Here are four important reasons. First, they are the right paths because they lead to the right destination, the shepherd's home. Second, they are the right paths because they keep us in harmony with the right person, the shepherd himself. Third, they are the right paths because they train us to be the right people like the shepherd. Fourth, they are the right paths because they give us the right witness. As we come, become rather the right people, we give glory to the Lord. They are right or righteous paths, whether the going is easy or hard. Comes from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Monday, June 27. Okay, people like Job and Abraham seem to have had a very personal relationship with God. And how many copies of the Bible did they have? How many translations did they have? They didn't have any books even. They didn't have any books. The very first books of the Bible were not even written yet. Okay. Wow. So how did they do? There was no pastor. They didn't have any prophets to prophesy to them. How did they maintain that great relationship with God? They, they spoke felt, directly with him. They spoke with him. That's true. They felt comfortable even in asking him very blunt and very pointed questions and even arguing with him. Is that the way we should treat God. The children of Israel were led by God and the pillar of the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. God spoke to them on Mount Sinai. So with a God like Jesus, why do we have problems in our life? And why do we have challenges? Challenges. If Jesus was our example, how could we think that we could avoid all problems? Think about what happened to him. David certainly understood that there would be some challenges for each one of us on our path. And Gary now. Psalms 23, 4. Even if I go through the deepest darkness, I will not be afraid. Lord, for you are with me. Your shepherd's rod and staff protect me. Good News Bible. Okay. Think back over what you know about the story of David. He began life as the youngest son of a landowner and shepherd living in the city of Bethlehem. When he reached the appropriate age, David, as the youngest son, was expected to herd sheep and goats and perhaps cattle. There were times when that proved to be a very dangerous job. How do we know that? David himself described fighting lions and bears while trying to protect his father's sheep. So do you now, think that the other sons uh, were also herding sheep? Or was it just the youngest son? I suspect it was all of them, wasn't it? Probably all of them, yeah. He wasn't even afraid of giants, was he? In Psalm 23, David recognized that there will be detours in our journey as we follow Jesus Christ. 
Wouldn't it be nice if the paths of righteous, righteousness led only along grass-covered banks and beside cool streams? And I don't know how many of you enjoy hiking in the mountains, but if you're hiking in the mountain, especially if it's been dry for a while and you haven't anything to drink and you come to a beautiful clear stream and nice grass alongside the stream, it's a pretty pleasant sight. But David recognized that the lives of sheep as he knew them from his childhood were not like that. So what is a valley of the shadow of death? At certain times of the year, the... Wadis. Wadis. Yes. What are wadis? <laughs> those, those are deep, sharp, deep little valleys. Oh. Wadis and ravines found in Jerusalem are prone to flash floods. Israel. I'm, Sorry, Israel. Don't ask me where Jerusalem came from. <laughs> Are, they're prone to flash floods that come, that can come unexpected, unexpectedly and prove overwhelming. These places also are characteristically narrow with steep sides that block out the light. Hence, the shadow of death is the image for a very deep shadow or deep darkness adult sa Sabbath school Bible study guide. I have the hardest time saying that. So it's a coolie. It's a coolie. It's a coolie? Yeah. The deep, dark shadow going down into oh, the coolie. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that was, and, and that would be a cooling place would be nice in the, in the, in the summers in, in yeah. a place like Palestine. But a flash flood can come very quickly as we've yeah. learned at Lake Powell. It can. Is a wadi an Australian term? Uh, no, that's a, that's that's an Arabic Arabic term. Arabic term. Yeah, we do not know exactly when this psalm was written. Ellen White hinted that this psalm may have been written during David's youth, while he was working as a shepherd in the hills of Bethlehem, or possibly a little later in his life when he was being pursued by Saul. Then it might be a good place to hide in the uh, yeah. deep. I've had the privilege of one time walking up a, a wadi, up a steep little wadi, up to, following a stream, and on the side of this hill there's a number of caves, and one of those caves was where David was hiding when Saul came in to relieve himself and, or to rest. I don't know what exactly he was doing. David was cut off a corner of his thing. It, it's right there. I mean, they don't know which one, but there's... This is the place, and there are several of these caves right alongside the, the, on the hill there. <laughs> Have you ever had a scary, even life-threatening event happen to you? At that point, did you think about the shepherd who was beside you? What was David thinking when he talked about the sheep wandering in a wadi or valley with the potential for death? Did the sheep get there by wandering away from the herd without the notice of the shepherd? Or is it possible that at times the, sheep even let, the shepherd even led the sheep into such a valley? In our case, with our divine shepherd, we may not see him. However, no matter what difficulties we travel through, we can be sure that he is present with us. One Bible commentator wrote, This is a quotation through the Bible study guide. Quote, a lamb was found a lamb who found himself in the valley of the shadow of death might conclude that he had been falsely led. It was needful for him to traverse that darkness in order to learn not to fear. The shepherd is still with him. From Elizabeth Elliot in Quest for Love. Have you ever been in led have you ever had the experience of being led into a dangerous situation by a false shepherd? The devil would do anything he possibly could to falsely lead us into one of his dark valleys. The time when the sheep are in greatest need is not when they are quietly resting in the green pat grass beside still waters, but rather when they are in deepest, greatest danger, even threatened with loss of life. Would that not be the time when the true shepherd is nearest us? That is the time when our fair weather friends abandon us. David also recognized another surprising detour as he wrote Psalm 23, and this is verse 5. You prepare a banquet for me where all my enemies can see me. You welcome me as an honored guest and fill my cup 
to the brim. Now I'm trying to think they figure this out here. All my enemies can see me, and here I am sitting as an honored guest. Uh, there's something wrong with that picture. What kind of a situation is that? God is preparing a banquet for us on the in the full presence of our enemies. Enemies can be very difficult to deal with. Sometimes we might even lay awake at night trying to figure out how to deal with them. In some cases, you might lie awake at night trying to think of ways to avoid your enemies who might even be the people with whom you have to work every day. I've had that experience once or twice. Have you had to deal with people who wanted to do you harm? When you were in such a situation, did you think of Matthew 5, 44, or Romans 12, 18 through 21? Jim? Matthew 5, verse 44, Jesus said, But now I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is from the Good News Bible. Romans 12, 18 to 21. Do everything possible on your part to live in peace with everybody. Never take advantage, my friends, but instead let God's anger do it. For the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay back says the Lord. I'm going to interrupt there for a second. How does the Lord pay back or revenge? He may let things happen that neither party expected. But it doesn't mean that God is the active, active agent, of course. Would he would be allowing such things to happen? Well, this old statement that uh, from the Bible commentary, God is accused of doing that which he does not prevent and that which he allows. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will take revenge. I will pay back, says the Lord. Instead, as the scripture says, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them a drink. For by doing this, you will make them burn with shame. Do not... Let evil defeat you. Instead, conquer evil with good. Good news, Bible. Instead of talking about how he dealt with his enemies, David talked about God's presence and how God cared for him even while his enemies were looking on. Carrie? In David's culture, when an honored guest came for a feast, the host would anoint his head with oil as the guest was about to enter the banquet hall. The oil was a mixture of olive oil and perfume. Wow. Then the guests would be seated in front of far more food than one could ever eat. It comes from the adult Sabbath school Bible study guide. Does that remind you of any stories in the Bible? Joseph. And what did Joseph and do? Benjamin. He, Joseph had presented to Benjamin in the presence of his Old, ten older brothers, well, actually mm -hmm. eleven, I guess, counting him, Joseph himself, five times the food that anyone else got. Yeah, to see what kind of response. And remember, these are people who just come out of a famine. They were, they were the probably of, all uh, very hungry. And they were in the midst of a famine. I mean, they'd come out of being in a famine in their area. And so here, he, the youngest son gets this five times as much food. Huh? <laughs> What's going on here? David mentioned a table, oil, and a cup. What do these items make you imagine? Sounds like something good to have, right? Does God sometimes treat us as a special guest at a banquet? What would that be like? Do you ever find that when you're studying scripture, you discover something that you didn't understand before, and it's a great blessing? That would be a banquet, wouldn't it? You know, I always wondered about um, Jesus and with his disciples. Did he pick out anyone that was higher than anybody else? I guess he had the three that he took up the hill with him, and yeah. everybody kind of miffed at that. Yeah. But um, and they took him. He took those three into the garden with him at Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess, yeah, a little bit. Now there might be a reason for that. Peter always Peter was a little older and always took a little more obvious position among the three, so that might be why he was chosen. It's very possible, we can't prove this, but it's hinted at in the scriptures that James and John were Jesus' cousins. So maybe that's why they got a little bit better treatment. 
Who knows? I, I don't know. Or but, at least why they thought they should. Or may, well, they clearly thought they should get better treatment, didn't they? Their, they brought their mother into the, into the whole business and says, please, you know, can one of us sit on one side and one of us sit on the other side when you start your kingdom? Hmm. Jesus, I don't think you understand everything you need to know yet. Well, our most serious enemies are not those we see, but rather those we do not see. What does that mean? We are surrounded by the forces of evil which are constantly seeking to lead us astray or to damage us or harm us in some way. Ephesians 6.12 for we are not fighting against human beings, but against the wicked spiritual forces in the heavenly world. The rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers of the dark age. Good News Bible. Very good. There are times when it is impossible to explain what is happening without having a clear picture of the great controversy and the role of God and the role of the devil in our world. And, and that is clearly the case in a lot of Bible stories. You need to have that background to understand, oh, okay, so that's why that happened. Okay. So, going back to Psalm 23, Myra. Oh, oh, I was jumping down further. Psalms 23, 6. I know that your goodness and love will be with me all my life, and your house will be my home as long as, as I live. So that sounds like quite a change from walking through the valley of the shadow of death, doesn't it? Or sitting in full view, well, sitting in full view of our enemies? What kind of a conclusion is that? Would God ever leave us alone in the presence of the devil and his fellow evil angels? To help us grow more? Well, I don't think he would leave you alone. That could happen if we choose to follow the devil instead of following God. Notice very carefully that David recognized that God's goodness and love would be with him all his life, and finally, ultimately, God's home would be his home. Recognizing the truths about the great controversy, we also recognize the following facts. Ephesians 1, 4 from the Good News Bible. Even before the world was made, God had already chosen us to be His through our union with Christ, so that we would be holy and without fault before Him because of His love. Then okay. 2 Peter 2, 1 through 10. Pardon me, for 2 Peter 1, 10. So then, my brothers and sisters, try even harder to make God's call and His choice of you a permanent experience. If you do so, you will never abandon your faith. And Hebrews 11, 13 to 15. It was in faith that all these persons died. They did not receive the things God had promised, but from a long way off they saw them and welcomed them, and admitted openly that they were foreigners and refugees on earth. Can I interrupt for just a second now? This is right almost in the middle of the famous faith chapter. So he's been talking, starts out with Abel, and he goes on, he talks about Noah, and he talks about Abraham and Sarah, and right on this whole list of people. And we assume, believe it or not, there's even, even Samson's in that list, and Gideon and so forth, we assume that since the Bible quotes them as examples of faith, does that mean they're going to be in heaven? I think that all the Israelites are there also. All the Israelites? What didn't it doesn't it say and the Israelites that came out of Egypt yeah, or something I, to that effect? I, yeah, clear at the end, I guess it does. And yet some of them were very wicked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when God chooses somebody, like before the earth was made, what, what does that mean? Well, what, what that has to mean is that God, somehow, we don't know how he could possibly do this, but somehow he manages to look down to, into the future and, and know what choices we're going to make so that he knows who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. Now, of course, our Calvinistic friends are going to jump on that and say, well, that means we don't have any freedom. Well... And my response to that, which wouldn't satisfy them, I'm sure, is, okay, guess what? There are some things that God understands that I don't understand. What a surprise. 
Okay. Continuing go ahead. on, Hebrews 11, now verse 14. Those who say such things make it clear that they are looking for a country of their own. They did not keep thinking about the country they had left. If they had, they would have had the chance to return. Okay. Good Bible. Some translations say that goodness and unfailing love, God's covenantal commitment, will follow me all the days of my life. However, the original verb is much stronger and the text should read that, that goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. In fact, it's the same Hebrew word, Hebrew verb, used in such verses as Genesis 14, 14. We'll look at those in, we'll look at those in a moment, but let, there's one here that I didn't mention. Look at 1 Samuel 25, 29. If anyone should attack you and try to kill you, the Lord your God will keep you safe as someone guards a precious treasure. As for your enemies, however, he will throw them away as someone hurls stones with a sling. So, and coming back to our passages here. Genesis 14, 14, when Abram heard that his nephew had been captured, he called together all the fighting men in his camp, 318 in all, and pursued the four kings all the way to Dan. Now that's not just following, that's pursuing, okay? Joshua 10, 18 and 19. Place some guards here, but don't stay there yourselves. Keep on after the enemy and attack them from the rear. Don't let them get to their cities. The Lord your God has given you victory over them. So if you're after your enemies and you're trying to keep them from getting to their cities where they will be protected, what do you call that? Pursuit. That's pursuit, isn't it? That's pursuit, yeah, absolutely. So how has it impacted your personal life to know that God is pursuing you with his love and goodness? Can you even imagine anything better than that? If we keep in mind that God's unfailing love and goodness is following us and pursuing us wherever we go, shouldn't that make life easier? Or is the fact that God is pursuing us and we accept him as our leader, does that make us a special target for Satan? Does he know that God is pursuing us? Oh, yeah. Of course he does. The best way to deal with pre present problems is always to think of them in the context of the great controversy which God, through Jesus Christ, has already done what? Won. He hasn't lost, he won. We know what the final ending will be. God wins. That's a conclusion. There's no, there's no question about it in any way. At the end, what's going to happen? God wins. Think of all the evidence that God has given us, that, given that he is pursuing us with his love. Imagine all that Jesus did to try to convince us of his love. In imagination, look again at the cross where God himself is hanging and the human Jesus is dying for you. Um, I, don't, I don't know how that grabs you, but it's incredible. I mean, here's God. You know, we usually present Jesus hanging there with a loincloth around his waist, he had nothing around his waist, I can tell you. The people who were crucified were crucified as what? Traitors to the Roman government. And the purpose of crucifixion was to be a, make it as embarrassing as possible so that nobody else would be tempted to do anything like that ever again. So, I mean, I understand our Victorian morals and I'm happy to have Jesus wearing a loincloth there but I can tell you he was not I'm absolutely certain he was not they were doing everything they could to make this as awful as possible and not to mention the fact that he's covered with blood and he's got a crown of thorns on his head and all that kind of stuff well if you are not sure how much God cares about you notice these passages from Ellen White. We know, let's look at these one at a time. Jim? Every soul is as fully known to Jesus as if he were only one for whom the Savior died. He cares for each one as if there were not another on the face of the earth. Ellen White, wow. Desire of Ages, page 480, verse so, paragraph 1. Yeah. Think about that. He's saying that every one of us is as closely 
God's, Jesus' attention is as close on it, to us as if there was nobody else in, in our world. Uh, that that's, just blows me away to think about that. Carrie, mm -hmm. do you want to take the next one there? Yeah. The soul that has given himself to Christ is more precious in his sight than the whole world. The Savior would have passed through the agony of Calvary that one might be saved in his kingdom. How many? One. 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 Yes. One person. He would have done that for one person. Of course, we know that the whole process of Christ's life and death on this earth is more than just for our salvation. What else is it for? For the whole universe. Yeah. It's, entire, it's for the whole universe and to answer the questions and accusations against God and the whole universe. So this is a... This is a narrow perspective, but uh, it, it's still true. Go ahead. He will never abandon one for whom he has died. Unless his followers choose to leave him, he will hold them fast. And that's from Desire of Ages, page 480, paragraph 5. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. That is, Jesus was saying, my Father has so loved you that even that He even loves me more for giving my life to redeem you in becoming your substitute and surety by surrendering my life, by taking your liabilities, your transgressions. I got that wrong. Trans That's right. Oh, no, I had it right. I, I am endeavored to my Father. Endeared to my Father. Yeah. Ellen, That's an incredible state. Well, go ahead. I'm just going to say it's from Ellen G. White, Desire of Ages, page 483, 5 through 484. Zero. Yeah. yeah. Imagine that. Jesus said that he, his Father loves him even more because of what he did for us. He loves us so much. His Father loves us so much that he loves his Son even more because he was willing to do all that for us. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to imagine what it would be like to go to heaven and see the, and we have, Ellen White says this very clearly, we have the, the rest of eternity really to review the plan of salvation. Think about it step by step and everything that's happened here, wow. Can you think of times in your life when you might have been disciplined in the school of Christ? Take a few minutes and review carefully the chapters entitled Calvary. You know, that's what that was all about, the crucifixion. And it is finished in the book of Desire of Ages by Ellen White. Those chapters have transformed my life. I just, I read them, I look at them, I, I thought I should learn how to, I should memorize them. But they're just incredible. If you had any questions about the lengths to which Jesus was well, willing to go for you personally, these chapters should answer those questions. In, these, in this week's lesson, we have noted these three major themes. Gary? Number one, it is very important to understand that our life is a journey that takes different turns. Number two, it also is crucial to remember that this path does not wind chaotically by chance. God is our guide and shepherd, and he may allow us to transverse or traverse, traverse yeah. or actively take us through the valleys of suffering and death. But God does not expect us to make this journey blindfolded. Rather, he gives us a sure promise that he will lead us to salvation. Number three, there is no way to survive the crucibles of life if we do not trust our shepherd to take us through them. Okay. The adults to teachers Sabbath school with Bible study guide. Yeah. However, let us be certain of the following truths. Okay. One biblical represent representation of life is of the path through 
a landscape. This path follows the trajectory from birth to death. There is not one, but two paths. The first path is a good path, the path of justice and righteousness, Proverbs 8.20. Let's just look at that really quick. Okay, I, want, I walk the way of righteousness, I follow the paths of justice. Okay. Um, uh, that leads to prosperity in life, Psalms 1, 2, and 3. Which we've already read. For God himself makes the path smooth, Proverbs 2, 8, and Isaiah 26, 7. Those who walk on the good and, or righteous path are guided by the divine word that serves as a lamp for their feet when their life is dark, Psalms 119, 105. Eventually, their path becomes progressively brighter as the midday. Proverbs 4.18. Okay, now I'm going to interrupt for a second. Do you find as you walk the Christian path that it just gets brighter and clearer and easier as you go along? No. No? <laughs> no? It hasn't there, there, yet. It hasn't. There are highlights. Okay. Yeah, highlights, okay. But in terms of those of us living near the end of this world's history, what do we know that's coming? A bit darker. It's going to be a lot darker. The worst worth that's ever happened in this world's history, right? Yes. So I'm not quite sure about that statement. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Eventually, their path becomes progressively brighter as midday. Those on this path also acknowledge God in all aspects of life. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Although this path leaves, leads to life, it is narrow and few walk on it, Matthew 7, 14. The second path is a bad or, a, or the sinful path. This path is, why, this is a, the wide path that leads to inequity, superficial existence, and death, Psalms 1, 4, and 5, and Proverbs 14, 2, and Matthew 7, 13. Let me just review a couple of those. The Proverbs 9, 14, 12. What do you think is the right road what you think is the right road may lead to death. So, you know, it, it's, it's people, all the people are walking that, ro that wide path. You think they're, they think that they're going on the right trail? You bet. They, they think this is the right place for them. There's probably some who question, well, maybe it's not where I should be, but most of them probably think they're where they should be. They're very happy with that. And of course, we know about Matthew 7, 13, go into the narrow gate because the gate to hell is wide and the road that leads to it is easy. And there are many who travel it. I, once in a while, I've thought about the question, okay, what would, what would people do if every morning they got up and says, okay, you're choosing the bad path, the evil path that leads to hell, the good path that leads to heaven. Okay, which path am I gonna go on today? If they had a clear mark every day of <laughs> the two paths, what would people do? If it was only that simple. If only it were that simple, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, these two paths are described in considerable detail in various portions of Scripture. We've just looked at a couple of places. We know for sure that God clearly understands both of those paths. Don't we also understand that God can see clearly which of those two paths we are taking? Proverbs 5, 21. The Lord sees everything you do. Wherever you go, he is watching. Now I'm going to interrupt Does for a second. Does that mean he's big brother? Okay, well, that sounds a little like big brother, isn't it? So does God somehow keep his eyes on every person who lives on this earth or does he have angels that are keeping their eyes on everybody and they're reporting to him yes <laughs> i use these words on my grandson uh -huh. recently i see and it made him step back and he's how old he'll be six at the end of the month okay and it I was instructing him on the errors of his decision making uh -huh. and, uh -oh. <laughs> and his lack of 
truth telling. Yes. And uh, when he realized that God was watching him, it was kind of like, you mean I can't get away? <laughs> <laughs> if grandma knows, then yeah. God knows. So. Yeah, wow. Okay. Proverbs 4, 14, do not go where evil people go. Do not follow the example of the wicked, also from Good News Bible. And then Psalms 1, 1, happy are those who reject the advice of evil people, who do not follow the example of sinners or join those who have no use for God. Okay, I'll take over there, Ezekiel 33, 11. Ezekiel told the people, now let's pick it up here for just a second. When did Ezekiel live? During the uh, Babylonian captivity. During the Babylonian captivity. And where was he living? He was in Jerusalem, wasn't he? No. no. He was not. He was one of the ones that was taken into the uh, second export of people, the second, the first time Nebuchadnezzar took Daniel and his three friends and a few others to be what he hoped would be ambassadors of the Babylonian Empire back to Jerusalem. And the second time he got disgusted, he came in and... Back and he, to Babylon, you mean? Yeah, back to Babylon. And the second time he came and he took most of the people from Israel and he just took the whole lot of them over and scattered them around in, in, the, in, the, in Babylonia, around Babylon. And Ezekiel was near the Kibar River there in not too far from Babylon. And he was there with the settlement of Jews that were probably expected to raise crops or whatever for, for Babylon. So this is what God said through Ezekiel. Ezekiel told him, I mean, God told Ezekiel that God had told him to say, quote, tell them that as surely as I, the sovereign Lord, am the living God, I do not enjoy seeing sinners die. I would rather see them stop sinning and live. Israel, stop the evil you're doing. Why do you want to die? So that almost sounds like, and, and that's, that's a recurrent theme in the book of Ezekiel. He says it several times, you know, why do you want to die? It sounds a little bit like my suggestion earlier, you know, here's a big sign. This is the evil path. This is a good path, you know. Abba. So they were taken into captivity because they were doing evil and yes. God allowed them to be captured. Yes. They didn't get it. No. They didn't figure it out. No. They did. Well, some of them did. Daniel did, obviously. I, I wonder, I, I've wondered this many times, Daniel was like prime minister of Babylon and then of Medo-Persia. Was he able to communicate with the Jews, all the Jews who were under him in the kingdom? Uh, like, did Ezekiel get messages from Daniel somehow or other? And did he get any messages back from them? Um, well, he had access to writings of other prophets. Yeah, he did, there's no question. Sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. but whether he had some special direct connection to just the Jews or did he, when he, when he made a proclamation, was that to everybody and the Jews would just have to draw their own conclusions? I don't know. Mm. Okay, our Bible study guide comes to the following conclusions. Jim? Yes, the end of each of the two paths is determined. The path of righteousness leads to life and the path of iniquity leads to death. But being on the path, excuse me, being on one path or another is a matter of our choice. If we decide to be on the path of righteousness, God promises that the righteous path will take us to life. Adult Bible Study Guide, page 14. Okay. Now, remember we're studying, we're beginning a series of 13 lessons on being in the crucible with Christ. So, choosing the right path doesn't mean it's all going to be easy. Consider what the Bible study guide says about the way and walking in the way. Carrie? Fledgling Christianity was at the first called the way. 
X92, X199, 23, X224, X2414, 22, or... Let me interrupt for just a second. Let me just quote one of those passages, probably familiar, uh, and ask the letters. Paul asked for letters from the high priest in, in introduction to synagogues in Damascus so that he should, if he should find there any followers of the way of the Lord, he would be able to arrest them, both men and women, and bring them back to Jerusalem. So on that fateful trip that he made to Damascus, what was his intention? Arrest. Arrest any Jews who were following followers of Jesus and take them back to Jerusalem to be prosecuted, right? Because that this this but notice the expression here, the way of the Lord. That's what it was that's what it was called among early Christians. Okay, and lots of other verses. You see all the other verses there. Go ahead. I just wondered where I left off. <laughs> and received <laughs> even more instruction while on it. Acts 18, 25, 26. New King James Version. The Apostle Paul also associates religion with walking and insists that Christians can no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futilities of their mind. That's from Ephesians 4.17. The Apostle John exhorts us to walk in God's commandments and in his love. That's 2 John 1.6. An adult teacher, Sabbath school, Bible study guide. Okay, so why do you suppose early Christians called themselves followers of the way or the way of the Lord? Because it was a way, a okay. way of life. It was a I way mean, of but going, a way of understanding. <laughs> didn't the Jews feel like they were following the way of the Lord? They believed that they were just on the bus and it was going to take them there and they were going to automatically be in the kingdom because they had Abraham's blood rolling, going through their veins. They were in the caravan. They were in the caravan, I see. Okay. Well, God had, Jesus had specific instructions on how you go, uh -huh. pick up your cross and follow me. Yep. And there's other things he said to do and that's the way of life for him. Okay. Well, is the Christian religion still the right way to live? Is Christianity still relevant in our day? It is... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, oh, Gary, okay. I'm sorry. It is true that the history of Christianity is littered with apostasy, abuse, deception, and corruption. Numerous times Christianity took divergent routes from Christ's path. But this does not mean there is no path of righteousness to be followed. Jesus remains the path and he promises us that he, his path is the truth and that it will take us to life, eternal life. Even if it's narrow, even if it's the cru crucibles, it is the only and the, the best path to life. Our shepherd will take us there, adult. Okay. Okay. The Western concept of the word religion comes from the Latin, re plus... Ligari. Ligari. I don't want to mess up the words, so you're going to help me here. <laughs> to tie again, to reconnect. While it has been developed in the Western Christian environment, this term makes sense from the biblical perspective, too, and can be connected to the biblical view of religion as a path or journey. When humanity took the path to perdition, we lost the connection with with God. Religion is that process through which humans and God are reconnected. How can, but how do we reconnect with God? If religion is the path and the journey, is it not an atemporal? It is not. It, it is not an atemporal, a, a his, historical phenomenon. 
as it is pagan myth mythological and philosophical <laughs> religions. Yeah. Uh, rather, in the biblical view, religion or the reconnection of humanity with divinity is a process in time and space. It is a personal and historical journey, both for God and for us. God comes to us and meets us where we are in history. Another difference between pagan and biblical religions is that, the, is that in pagan religions, people must clear a path for themselves to find the way to the world of the gods, to earn their favors, to reconnect to them, or to steal their secrets or the secret of eternal life. In the biblical religion, on the contrary, it is God himself who clears the path for us, path to us, rather. He comes to us seeking to save us and to take us back to the path of life, to take us back to himself. In fact, he himself comes, becomes the path and the guide and the shepherd. He walks with us through the valley, guiding us on that path of reconnecting to God. This is God's religion, the religion of grace. Are we sure of which of those two paths we are on? Are, are you sure who it is that is your guide? Do you have friends who are on the right path as well? How many people that you associate with are on God's path? Are you afraid that you might be using the opposite path? What could you do to help them? Let us never forget that we are never going to be asked to go through something that Jesus did not go through before us. We can trust our shepherd to take us through the crucibles of life because before permitting us to pass through crucible, crucibles, the shepherd himself went through that crucible. But there is an essential difference between his crucible and ours. Many of our crucibles are caused by ourself or other humans or by the consequences of sin in general. The shepherd's crucible was caused by us and the devil. Mm. And he took it upon himself sacrificially, substitutionally, and redemptively. How does this understanding help you go through suffering from the teacher's Bible study guide? Okay, so that's our question. We're going to be talking about crucibles right through this entire quarter. Uh, and the challenges it makes if we go through difficult situations. We're going to study a lot of people who have been through different, difficult situations, and that includes us. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to start this series of lessons to learn more about the challenging parts of our journeys and the challenging events that are ahead of us. May we come closer to you through these studies is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.